So good to see all of you here, and uh, if you are new here, I want to add my welcome to the welcome that you have already received. My name is Mbonisi, and I'm part of the leadership team here at One Tribe. And um, it really is great to see all of you, and uh, I know that a lot of you, like Sean was saying, have been invited along to celebrate, have some fun together as a team, and that's the plan for this morning. And uh, we're starting this Reimagining Work series. It's going to last for five weeks, and the reason we're doing it is because work is actually pretty important. On social media during the next week or two, we're going to be posting some statistics to get our heads around, and one of those is that most of us will spend one-third of our adult lives in the workplace or 90,000 hours. That's a lot of time. And uh, it's a lot of time to be doing the wrong thing or to be doing perhaps the right thing for the wrong season, for the wrong reason. And people have different ideas about work. I wonder what you think about your work. I wonder what your family thinks about your work. I wonder what your boss thinks about your work. And I'd be willing to bet that all three of those, what you think, what your boss thinks, what your family thinks, are not identical. And so for the next five weeks, we're going to be getting an alternative perspective on our work. And it's going to be taken primarily from this book that is 2,000 years old. And as some of you here, you might not consider yourselves Christians and uh, if I can speak to you for just a moment, sometimes we can think that Christianity is irrelevant to my modern day-to-day -day life. And if you think that, that's probably because you haven't spent much time reading this book in the right way. And over the coming weeks, we're going to see that it is actually incredibly relevant to every area of our lives, including work. And that's why we're inviting you and we're inviting you to invite as many of your friends as you can and work colleagues over the coming weeks to come and explore what this ancient book tells us about very modern challenges and living in our modern world. And as we do that, um, most of uh, the messages from this series are going to be based on a book by a gentleman by the name of Tim Keller. It's called Every Good Endeavor. I got it off Kindle. I think it's about 500 bob, and it's an awesome investment to help you think about your work and connect your work to what God is doing on planet Earth. And another resource I just want to highlight is um, over the last uh, or last year around this time, we did a six-part series called God at Work. And those messages are on the website, and you can download those and listen to them as you are um, jogging or commuting to work or whatever it may be. But to kick us off, I want us to start off with a little bit of a mind experiment, and I'd like you to track along with me if you can. I want you to imagine that instead of your work, whatever your work is, and by the way, chances are you might think, hey, uh, I'm not working, is this series relevant to me, or I'm a student, is this series relevant to me? If you are in between jobs, now is a great time to be figuring out actually what is work about as I'm looking for employment. And if you are not yet working, you're a student or you're in high school, now is the right time to be figuring out what is this work thing all about that I'm going to spend one third of my adult life doing. If you're a full-time mother, do full-time mothers work? Good answer, just checking. I knew that already before I asked. But I want you to imagine that whether you're a full-time mother or you are a lawyer or accountant or, or a, a, a whatever your, your job is, I want you to imagine for a moment that your job is you're actually a shop owner. And you own a shop and one morning you, you open up business as normal. Customers come in, things are, people are moving around your store. And then all of a sudden, one of your workers comes to you and they are in an absolute panic. We see what's happened is without anyone knowing, overnight someone broke into your store. A mischief maker went and started swapping the price tags around on goods. So the things that would cost tens of thousands of shillings are priced at just a few bob. And things that cost 30 bob, 40 bob, are being sold for 20 or 30 times the amount. And you can imagine what's happening. Customers at the till are indignant. Employees are bewildered. As a good shop owner, you would understand that the best thing to do in that moment is to stop all trading. 
reorder the price tags or the value system of the store until everything is back in order and normal and more sensible trading can resume. Well, the Bible says that something similar has happened to you and I. Check it out in Isaiah 53, verse 6. It's talking about the way we think. It's talking about our value system and our culture today. Let's read it out together. Count of three. One, two, three. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. I don't know where you were in uh, your primary school or perhaps if you made it to high school in your high school, maybe you were top of the class, maybe you were bottom of the class. But the people at the top of the class can be pretty impressive. Did you have one of those in your school? They just take all the prizes. And as human beings, we can start to think that we're very intelligent as we invent new things and we, we discover new things and we have new abilities and we can send spaceships out into outer space. We can think that we're very, very intelligent but the Bible for 2,000 years has been saying the same thing. Those guys, sheep. Exactly. And you think, did he just call me a sheep? Well, actually, not just a sheep, a lost sheep. And I've just been reflecting on that this last couple of weeks as I've been listening to the news and watching what's happening and this is what this country believes and this is what this country is doing and this is what those people are doing over there. And I can think to myself, you know, but I thought that we were so intelligent. I thought that we'd come so far. Then the Bible reminds me that ultimately, outside of Jesus, we're actually all like sheep that have gone astray. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about how we might have misplaced our values in a lot of areas of life. But I want to talk specifically right now about the area of our work. How have we lost our way? I want to present a new scenario to you. I know that some of you are parents. Some of you might not be parents. But for a moment, I want us to all imagine that we have a child. And if you have a child, you can uh, imagine it's one of your children. And here's the good news. For today's scenario, you get to choose what their occupation will be. Some of you are looking at me thinking I'm doing that anyway. That's, that's fine. That's up to you and your child. But I want you to imagine for a moment, you can choose what your child will do. And I'm going to give you five options up on the screen. We're going to run through them, and then I'm going to ask you to stand for the one that you would choose for your, for your, uh, for your child. Number one is a vlogger. <laughs> Some of you are wondering, what is a vlogger? If so, you can speak to our man, Roy, at the back over there, and uh, a couple of weeks from now, we'll be interviewing him. Part of his job is helping parents understand how to prepare their children for jobs that don't exist yet, and uh, that's just a bit of a sneak preview for this. Number two, they win the lottery, and so they don't have to work. Would you love that for your child? Number three, number three is an accountant. Number four is a farmer. And number five is a police officer. Okay. You've got to choose one of those. All right, I'll try to make it as broad as I could. And now, just very quickly, I'm going to ask you to stand. And please, you've got to pick one and stand. I'm going to ask you to stand, and you'll stand in the group with people who have chosen the same thing as you. How many of you go for number one? I would choose vlogger for my child. Okay, Adrian, great to see you. Two people, awesome. Yeah. Grab a seat. Number two, how many of you would choose for your child to win the lottery and never have to work a day in their lives? We've got the, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Here we go. Okay, the great grab a seat. How many of you would choose to, that your child would be an accountant? Chartered accountant, big firm. All right, grab a seat. Number four, how many of you would choose that your child would be a farmer? Whoa! Okay, grab a seat. <laughs> and number five, how many of you would choose that your child would be a policeman? Fantastic. I love it. Okay, grab a seat. Well done. You all did great with that. Now, I'm not sure that there's a right or wrong option to choose. 
Track with me. I'm not sure that there's a right or wrong option to choose, but there are right or wrong reasons for why you would choose or not choose a certain option for your child. And I want to talk a little bit about not just what we value, but I also want to talk about why we value certain things. And if we're going to do that, we actually need to go back a couple of thousand years and talk about the ancient Greeks because they have affected a lot of the way that you and I think today. Now, the ancient Greeks, they believed that the gods, plural, didn't want to work. And that's actually why they created you and me to get the work done. One of the great Greek thinkers, his name was Aristotle. What did Aristotle believe? Aristotle believed that to have a worthwhile life, you needed the ability to live without having to work. You see, to the ancient Greeks, work was a curse and not a blessing. Another Greek thinker, his name was Plato. Plato believed and taught this. He said that our physical bodies are a hindrance to our souls in the pursuit of truth. And because of that, the less involved that people like you and me could be in the material world, and especially work like physical work, the better, because that was a barrier to the highest kind of life. Now, the Greeks weren't foolish. They understood that work had to be done to make the world work, but they also put work into different kinds of categories. There was better work and there was less better work. Work that used the mind rather than the body was nobler and less animalish. The highest form of work was the most mental and the least manual. In other words, the whole society assumed that slaves and craftsmen did the work, enabling the elite to devote themselves to the exercise of the mind in art and, and philosophy and, and politics. Let me give you a modern-day example. Most of you would know that uh, during the week I work at a hospital called Cure, and uh, the Cure team is here in full force, ready to dominate the Olympics. And so if you're part of the orthopedic cure team, could you just wave your hands and intimidate the other teams? There they are there. Fantastic to see you all. And um, so I'm an orthopedic surgeon. And during the week, uh, we work with uh, hammers and mallets and screwdrivers and, and plates and nails as we are fixing things. We're trying to make things straight. And so, because of that, in the medical world, orthopedic surgeons, also known as orthopods, have developed a bit of a reputation for not being the smartest, the, the sharpest pencil in the box. One of my mentors has a saying. He says that orthopedic surgeons are as strong as an ox and almost as clever as an ox, too. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I know. And, and some people have actually put this thing down in writing. And some of you might have seen this on the internet, but it says that if, if someone wants to help people and they like to use a hammer, then that person is Bob the Builder. If someone likes to use a hammer and has a God complex, in other words, they think they're God, then they might be Thor from the Avengers. If someone has a God complex, they think they're God, and they want to help people, well, Jesus was kind of like that. And if someone uses a hammer, has a God complex, and wants to help people, that person might be an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> Work, in our thinking, has become, first of all, out of all of this, the Greek thinking and our own desires and dreams for our children and so on, it's become a necessary evil. That's one of the implications of what we've just been talking about. A second implication is the idea that lower status or lower paying work is an assault on our dignity. In the Western world, for example, workers are increasingly divided into the kind of 
uh, white collar or knowledge classes, and then the more poorly paid blue collar or service sector. So subconsciously or consciously, the pattern of our thinking is that when it comes to work, consciously or subconsciously, we've divided work into four categories. The first and best category of work is actually no work. And that's who falls into this category. Number one, lottery winners. Number two, trust fund kids. Number three, those of us who can, uh, who can afford an early retirement. That's great, no work. The second category isn't as good as the first category. It's not as good as no work. But the second category becomes good work. Good work is work that is highly paying and intellectual, such as that of an accountant or lawyer. The third level is to be avoided if possible, and that is bad work. Bad work in our thinking can be low paying and manual jobs. There are at least these three categories to our work. There's a fourth category, I don't know where to put it, and that is church work. <laughs> it's fascinating because I... I uh, I, uh, I've, I've worked at different times in my life in full-time church work or in both church work and doctoring medical work. And so I've seen people's different reactions when you say to them, I'm a doctor, and when you say to them, I'm a pastor. Some people I say to them, I'm a doctor, and they think, wow, that's great, your parents must be so proud. Some people I say to them, I'm a pastor, and they're like, well, hang on to your wallet then, because... You've got to watch out for these guys. Or sometimes the converse. When some people hear a, 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 a doctor is working as a pastor as well, they think, wow, I'm glad you managed to upgrade to this spiritual calling. Or some people say there's nothing, it's not easy to improve on being an orthopedic surgeon with the hammers and nails and things. So according to our pattern of thinking, there are different levels of work. But I want us to get this this morning. Romans 12, 2 says this. It says, hey, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. The world has a pattern of thinking. Africa has a pattern of thinking. The West has a pattern of thinking. And don't just fit into that mold without some reflection and some consideration. In fact, the Bible says it even better. It says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We have the opportunity this morning to let the word of God renew our minds, challenge our thinking, even transform our thinking in this important area. And our main text for this morning is from Genesis 1, verses 26 to 27. Genesis 1 verses 26 to 27. It's up on the screen. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. One of the things we saw in our God at Work series last year is that whilst the Greeks and other philosophies of the time believed that, that gods didn't want to work, that's why they created human beings, uniquely, the Bible talks about a God who works. And that has huge, huge implications for how you and I view our work. We spoke about that last year, but in this scripture this morning, I want us to see two new things. The first thing is that of all the creatures in creation, it's only you and me who the Bible talks about as being made, listen to this, in the image of God. Only man and woman in God's image. The second thing we see is that of all creation, only you and me are given a job description as clear and as specific as the job description given to man and woman. And that is 
to rule. The Bible uses the word image about you and me. That is who you and I are. In Bible times, if there was a nation conquering other nations, the king of that empire, the conquering empire, would set up images of himself that resembled that king, kind of like how you have pictures of the president in a lot of places. They would have images of that king that would represent the king and also represent the rule of that king in that area, wherever his image was. And the Bible says you and I are made in the image of God. That means that we resemble God. That means that you and I were created to represent God and to rule on God's behalf as we represent him. We are called to stand in for God here on planet Earth. We have the privilege and responsibility of doing the things that God did in creation. God brought order out of chaos, and you and I have the privilege of bringing order out of chaos. That's why I love living in Africa. There is a lot of work to do. We see God creatively starting to build a civilization, man and woman in relationship to one another. We have the privilege of doing the same. We see God caring for what he has made. We have the privilege of doing the same with him. This is a major part of what we were created to be. So where am I headed with this, friends? I'm saying that work has dignity because it is something that God does. And because when we work, full-time mother, farmer, vlogger, accountant, lawyer, when we work, we do it in God's place as his representative. This challenges the thinking of our times because one of the implications of this is that because of what we see in the Bible, all work has dignity. Unless it's grossly immoral. If your work is robbing, that's not a good job. But outside of that, all work has dignity. Someone called Philip Jensen put it this way. He said it's up on the screen. If God came into the world, if you were making up a story about God and he was coming down into the world, what would he be like? Well, for the ancient Greeks, he might have been a philosopher king. The ancient Romans might have looked for a just and noble statesman. But how does the God of the Hebrews come into the world as a carpenter? Don't you just love that? In Mark chapter 6, verse 3, people are talking about Jesus. He's gone back to his hometown, and they say this, wait, 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 wait a minute. You mean to tell me that this guy is something special? <laughs> Isn't this the carpenter? Mary's son, right? Brother of James, Joseph, Judas, Simon. His sisters are here with us, and they took offense to them. They said that a carpenter can't be someone special. But friends, this is our Savior. No wonder the Apostle Paul wrote about Jesus in Philippians 2, verses 5 to 7. He said, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. That's a pretty cool status. It's a pretty cool job description. The corner office of the universe. But he didn't hang on to that. He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Jesus is presented in scripture, not just as king, but as carpenter and servant. And I think as the apostle Paul wrote these words, he, I, 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 I'm pretty sure he'd have been thinking back to the stories he'd, he'd have heard about one night Jesus taking off his outer garments with his disciples sitting around the room. And the Bible says he did what no one else was willing to do. He took the nature of a servant and he washed the disciples' 
feet. How many of you enjoy washing someone else's feet? I grew up, that is Christ-like. We've got one hand up over here. I grew up in the Anglican church, and uh, in the Anglican church, maybe about once a year, there was a foot washing ceremony. And for me, it was the most cringeworthy thing. I wasn't even doing the washing, but I was just like, wow. (laughs) What's wrong with washing feet? Well, they'd have been wearing sandals all day and walking in the dust and dirt and other unmentionable things that you find on the ground. I don't know if you've noticed, not your feet, but some people's feet smell. And I'm pretty sure Peter had smelly feet. But I can't prove that from Scripture, so we'll keep on moving. And Jesus knelt down and washed his feet. He took the nature of a servant because all work, all serving of mankind has dignity. And he took the dirtiest part of their bodies. And he began to remove the filth, remove the dirt. And friends, that's a spiritual picture, by the way, of what Jesus did when he died for you and I on the cross. Jesus did that so that when we bring our lives to him, he can remove the dirt and remove the filth and make us clean again so that the image of his heavenly father and our heavenly father can shine through again. Some of you think, no, 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 but if if I become a follower of Jesus, I've got to do what he says. Well, to be honest, that is part of it. But if he's the kind of savior who'll come from heaven to earth to be a carpenter and become your servant and clean the filth off my feet and your feet, why wouldn't you want to listen to what he has to say? It's time to start bringing this in for a landing because there are some prizes to be won. It doesn't seem as though God is as picky about the kind of work he does as you and I might be. In Genesis, we see God as a gardener. You ever think about that? Say to him on day six, what have you achieved? What, what, what are you proud of? Well, I think outside of the creation of man and woman, he'd have said, I made a beautiful garden in a place called Eden, and it's stunning. Genesis, we see him as a gardener. In the Gospels, we see him as a carpenter and as a servant. No task is too small a vessel to hold the immense dignity of the work given by God. That's all well and good, but what does it mean for you and I on a Monday morning? Four application points, one story, then we're done. Number one, Christians who understand this this principle are uniquely positioned. I want you to be uniquely positioned to honor all work and all workers. When you're at a hotel or restaurant, how do you treat the waitron, the waiter, the waitress? Their work has dignity. Yes, yes, they're serving you. Some of you might be full-time mothers. Maybe you look at working mothers, maybe you look up to working mothers and think, I wish I could be in the workplace instead of looking after this child. Or maybe you look down on working mothers and think you should be at home looking after your child. No, 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 no. All work has dignity. When we get this, we don't feel superior to anyone else because we earn more than them. We don't feel inferior to anyone else because all work has dignity. Full-time mums, full-time dads, Your greatest contribution to this world might not be something you do. It might be someone you raise. Think about that. Second thing is that as Christians who understand this, we have freedom to seek work that suits our gifts and our passions. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand that the ability to provide for ourselves, provide for our families is important But when we understand this, we're no longer driven by these things and no longer chase after them in the same way as people who don't understand the design and dignity of work. Why is this important? Number three, these truths free us up 
to be open to greater opportunities for work. What's the unemployment rate in Kenya? It's high. I remember one of my relatives went to university, had a great, um, had a great uh, qualification, a degree. They got it from overseas, I think, and then when, when they came back, they, uh, they couldn't get a job because they're saying no to all kinds of jobs. No, 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 that, 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 that's, no, 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 that, I need something that's a little bit more. Students in 20s, moving out into this environment of high unemployment. When we understand this, that all work has dignity, it opens our world up to so many more opportunities for work if we're not trapped in this mindset. And number four, as a Christian, how do we apply this? We need to, we need to make sure that we can identify with, conflict, with conviction and satisfaction the ways in which our work, whatever our work is, participates with God in his creativity and cultivation of planet Earth. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But even now, I hope you're beginning to see that because you are made in the image of God and because you are God's representative on Earth, when you walk into the bank, God walks with you because you're an image bearer of God and you're to rule and represent and bring order and peace, and joy, and God's kingdom wherever we go. Team, if we get this, this is why this is so important. If what we've heard this morning from Genesis sinks into our hearts, it can revolutionize the way you see yourself, and the way you see the people around you, and the way we see our work. All of a sudden, you have a worth in yourself that's totally separate from your job title or salary size, it is so freeing. I think it was Bill Johnson who said that God's opinion of me needs to become more important than other people's opinion of me and my own opinion of me. And his opinion tells me that all work has dignity and I'm an image bearer of God. When this happens as an individual, you become more centered because you don't feel overly superior around people who earn less than you or you don't feel overly inferior around people who earn more than you do. In fact, and this is when it gets exciting, when we get this, here's the good news, did you know that it becomes contagious and people around you start to catch what you've got? It's like the coronavirus. <laughs> People who hang around you, they'll need to have face masks on. Otherwise, they start to catch this dignity and this, this sense of royalty and this, this sense of purpose that comes from being image bearers of God. I'll tell you one example of where this happened. Uh, a friend of mine, he, he leads a church. His name, is, uh, his name is Simon. And people from his church went out on the streets. And this was their mission. They just went out in a group and they weren't evangelizing or what they were doing is they were thanking people for the work that they were doing. And they came up to someone and uh, this person was a parking meter maid. You know what a parking meter maid is? The people who give out the parking tickets. So they walked up to her and, they, and they, they, they just said, thank you for the job that you do. Without you, the streets of our town would be in absolute chaos. You know what happened next? that parking meter maid burst into tears. She explained to these Christ followers, these image bearers of God, that just that same day, she had had one person try to run her over deliberately. She had had another person as she was doing her job say to her, I hope you get cancer and die. But then the kingdom of God arrived and people came and gave dignity to that kind of work because God has given dignity to all kinds of work. Friends, the workplaces of our city are crying out for this. They don't know it, 
but they're crying out for the kingdom of God to come. And this series, Reimagining Work, is about how we can become the kinds of people who bring the kingdom of God just like that and in a thousand other ways. Mm-hmm.